Hi everybody, welcome to SneakCon 2020 CICD Part 3, CICD Best Practices. My name is Sean Miller. I'm a Senior Solutions Engineer here at Sneak. I also work on the enablement team as an enablement lead. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to... I'm Omuri. I'm the Customer Success Team Manager for the EMA and the APJ team and I'm super excited to be here today. Yeah, and we're super excited to have you here, Omri. Uh, you know, you've onboarded hundreds, if not thousands of customers. Uh, you know, you've got a really good wide view of customers uh, of various sizes. So, you know, we work with small customers who are two or three developers in a small startup, all the way to massive geographically diverse uh, companies where, you know, you may have hundreds or thousands of developers with tens of thousands of projects. Uh, and, you know, we really wanted to distill some of the best practices for you when you go to implement Sneak. Now, for the purpose of this presentation, we're gonna cover two key areas. We're gonna talk about rolling out the Sneak solution. We're also gonna be talking on how to action the results. Now, as I mentioned, we work with companies of various sizes and I wanna emphasize we don't have a one size fits all implementation rollout. We have a customer success management team of which Omri is a part of uh, that really helps tailor that solution to customers. So um, you may be familiar with this slide if you talked to Sneak before. Um, Omri, maybe you could talk, give us a little bit of a background in terms of how you onboard customers and really what are some of the best practices that you've seen that are most effective with customers who may be either looking to adopt a new tool or maybe they've already used security tools before and maybe you're deciding how to implement Sneak. So yes, as you mentioned, one of the biggest like you know stuff that we saw that was really important in order to you know to roll out Sneak as a solution into their SDLC and into the your into your CI/CD is making sure that you we understand like the the maturity level of the company and every team regarding like you know what they're used to like which tool they are used to to implement into their CI/CD and which functionalities. So it's been that like. What is important for us to make sure that we, that we are doing is that we're not creating any kind of a friction, but we're just creating awareness about the tool. So in the next slide, we can talk a bit more about like, you know, about the different stages. So the, the first stage is what we call like the awareness. And in this way, you know, when we give the awareness, we make sure that like that the tool itself is implemented in a way that it's not blocking nothing, like it's not blocking your SDLC, it's not blocking your, your CI/CD. It, it starts with people getting the results and seeing the results in, in, in to their pipelines. So some people will take actions and some other people won't take action, but they will start to see that there is a new tool in town. When they will want to move to the next phase, the next phase is when you start to use the, the monitor command. In this case, it's been that you start to take snapshots and your, your AppSec engineers and your security people and the team lead can start and review their, their application and their code and to see the status. In this phase, you start to advertise and telling everyone that the new tool was implemented in the, into the pipelines. And in a couple of weeks from now, based on like, you know, on a, on a requirements and based on the policy, uh, the, the, the tool will start to like, you know, to, to block the builds and make sure that we're not introducing new vulnerabilities. Yeah, and uh, Omri, if I may, I think you touched on a couple of very key points there. So one of the things that we talk a lot about is trust with development. And so what exactly do I mean by that? Well, you may be introducing a new tool uh, to development pipeline. And so um, one of the key things that you wanna ensure is regardless of whether you're security team purchasing tools for the development team, or maybe you're the development team buying new tools for your group, is you don't wanna impede the block the, and block progress with those pipelines in your application development. And so when we say don't block uh, the pipeline, what we're saying there is uh, continue doing your builds, integrate Sneak in there, get visibility, and you, you can still action on those results, but you're not impeding that pipeline because it can be very uh, upsetting sometimes where you implement a new tool and then suddenly you're getting blocked uh, from progressing in your workflow. Um, and so the first step is to introduce it, uh, drive awareness, make sure people understand what those tools and why they're being introduced. Uh, and then as people get more comfortable, as they buy trust in the results that they're getting, that's where you start turning on the controls. And by then they've already bought into it. It's uh, not as big of an obstruction. And more importantly, you also should identify certain key resources so that if it does become blocking, they have the capability to unblock and allow that to progress, um, certainly with the authority and the uh, inspection of what those results are. So yeah, absolutely. And the next phase will be like, this is the way where, when we start to put the control or how we call it, like stop the bleeding. So what does it mean? From this point, you set the this, this sneak test to, to fail the build and block the build based on the policy. What is a policy? It can be 
a severity threshold. It can be using like, you know, the exploit maturity level. And then you can make it that every time that a new vulnerability that is like, you know, in certain threshold and has a remediation and the exploit maturity is mature, block the bill. So in this point, you start to, to, to implement your policy and make sure that you're not introducing new vulnerabilities into your projects. From this point, when you want to move to the next phase, you start to take action on, to, on top of like, you know, your backlog issues. So it's been that like all, all the, st the relevant stakeholders will make sure that like legacy code issues and all like, you know, uh, so, like a vulnerability that you have in your code will start to be mitigated and like remediated based on their policy and on their, on their uh, you know, requirements and how they see like, you know, the mitigation plan. And I think that's a good uh, segue to our next topic, which is really around now that you have Sneak implemented, how do you actually action on the results? And so um, effectively, there's uh, two categories that we want to talk about. We want to talk about um, what, what do you do when you find an issue or what do you do if you find something that you consider a non-issue? And maybe Omri, can you talk about some of the workflows and tools and um, how you've seen customers be successful very early yeah. on? So. <clears throat> We, we see like, you know, several like methods. One of the methods is that using the ticketing system to make sure that you're populating actions and people taking action on, on, the, on, the, on the, you know, the high priority issues that need to be fixed. So one way is like using the Jira integration, for example, and manually you can populate and create like Jira tickets in order to, to drive action from, from the teams. Another way of doing it is using our plugins to create Jira tickets for new issues. Another method is using an, our API in order to like to auto create and use your policy and build automation to create Jira tickets, or even like you know using our API to push the data to other ticketing system. The last way that like you know as I said is people just will go and review the project and will generate and create tickets for the, to the ticketing system. It's important because in this case you can make sure that you're reducing the noise and people focusing on on fixing and remediating the you know the most high priority issues. Also, what we saw with some customers in their ticketing system, they will set an SLA. So it's mean that based on the data that they that they, they can see on the tickets, they will they will set an SLA. That means that like every time that they have a high severity issue, the team has like you know one day to fix the issue. So in this case, everybody can be on top of it and, and take and, and to be in control. Yeah, and again, I, I think you've hit on some very key points there and that one of the goals of Sneak is not to flood your Jira system with a whole bunch of tickets because, again, people become apathetic if there's a lot of noise. And so with Sneak, uh, one of the key capabilities very early on is that you can target those vulnerabilities, especially with that create a uh, Jira issue button. Um, but then as you get more sophisticated, as you start scaling this out, we have plugins like the Jira Tickets for New Volms plugin that would allow you to set criteria around what you're logging to Jira. And then of course the API, if you're creating your own integrations, that's something to be mindful as well, is that you don't want to uh, necessarily flood the ticket system. And so we built all our technologies around the idea that we really want to dial down the noise and ensure what the development team is getting effective. Uh, so thanks for that, uh, Omri. So the, the other category that we wanted to talk about as well is how do you deal with non-issues? And so when we talk about non-issues, you know, I usually like to break it up into three categories. So the first category is really um, acceptable risk or mitigated risk, meaning uh, you, know, you may have a bunch of internal applications that's uh, you know, in a closed network. Uh, maybe it's something that uh, you deprioritize based on uh, risk. And so that's where you may want to decide that certain packages or certain types of vulnerabilities are there a lower priority or something you may want to uh, ignore outright. And so you can either do that via the security policy or you can use, uh, we have a, an ignore capability in our product that Almer will be talking about in a moment. Um, then you have a second category of results, which is uh, effectively false positive. And so the idea is in the unlikely event, you find a false positive. So, uh, you know, a CV doesn't match a package or something like that. Our security team has done a phenomenal job of ensuring the accuracy of the database. But in that unlikely event, uh, we recommend reporting it to support, and then you can temporarily ignore it while the database is being updated. But it, again, um, that's something that's a rarity. And then you have a, a third category, 
which is uh, sometimes customers will uh, prioritize an issue on whether the vulnerable function within that package is actually called. And so um, Sneak introduced reachable vulnerabilities earlier this summer, and it was uh, the idea that we would help prioritize issues if we saw that vulnerable call being made. Uh, and it's important to state that um, just because a vulnerable method is not being used, within, being used within a package doesn't necessarily mean that either somebody can't figure out a way to invoke it or a developer might decide they use it later. And so that's something to keep in mind when you're enabling uh, ignoring of those packages. And so we have those capabilities in our tool to ignore it either temporarily or longer term. And uh, maybe Omri, can you give us some guidance in terms of how you've seen people do ignores? What are some of the best practices and methods you're seeing used? Of course. Today? So of course there, there's like, you know, the ability to do it like manually. So you can go to the GUI and you can ignore the issues for the monitor project. But another way that we saw it is like, people leveraging and using our API to create automation based on their policies and how they want it to be, you know, to be uh, implemented in a way that they're reducing this kind of a noise and make sure that they're focused on what needs to be fixed. Another way is using our sneak policy file. It's a file that you can attach to the root of the folder of your project and then setting all the ignores and the advantage there is proactively before you scan even the project for the first time you already can uh, make sure that like you know the issues are ignored and then you can maintain the file and then the ignores to this file another way is like a tool that our r d organization created and it's a python uh, client that, uh, that using and combining several uh, apis in order to make to to generate and create a better like advanced uh, functionalities for ignoring and then you can you know, you can automate the processes with the much more advanced uh, criteria and the requirements. Uh, it's worth also to say that we saw that some customers are like, uh, <coughs> that some customers like, uh, you know, they manage like a centric uh, policy file and then they can allow like, you know, to just to use it in a way that they don't need to maintain like, you know, for every project. And also worth to say that we have an API that will allow you to monitor and audit what was ignored and by whom it was ignored. And then you can make sure that everything is, is like, you know, based on your policy and nothing is like, you know, falling between the chairs. And it's probably important to state that the dot sneak file or the ignore policy that you would typically use with CICD, um, that's something where usually it would be stored in the root of your project, or if you have a mono repo, it would be within each folder where each manifest is located. Um, uh, if you do centralize your policy, understand that you're making a decision to ignore that package, whether it may be potentially vulnerable or not in different applications in different contexts. So certainly if you ignore something, um, definitely do that assessment and understand there is risk if you are ignoring it uh, broadly. So uh, with Sneak, we give you the capability to either do it per manifest or again, using that more central type policy. So thanks for that, Omri. So the, the last section, which we'll just go through very quickly, is uh, we wanted to highlight a few of the key plugins that people are using today. You'll see them actually used in several of the CI/CD presentations. Um, the first set of uh, plugins that we wanted to highlight were from our Sneak Tech Services team. So um, over the last, uh, I guess since the summer, they've been introducing some very key plugins that offer some very powerful capabilities. And the first one that I wanted to highlight is Sneak Delta. It's a plugin that effectively allows you to um, compare a bill to a previous snapshot and it'll effectively only fail on new issues that are being found. And that's a very key capability because you're dialing down the noise, you're effectively only failing the build. And I want to emphasize that separate from Sneak Monitor, which would only ever alert on new issues anyways. Um, from Sneak Filter, that's the idea where you potentially want to uh, only fail the build on certain key criteria. So the CLI by default will allow you to fail on severity. It'll also let you fail on, say, if there's a fix available. But a lot of customers have very sophisticated needs where maybe they're failing on uh, CV, uh, CVSS score or maybe on exploit maturity and so on. So previously where folks would parse the, uh, the JSON output, the plugin has a whole bunch of capabilities in, built in to let you do more advanced filtering. And then last but not least, we also have the JIRA tickets for new volumes. So we've had several plugins over the years. Um, this plugin off offers some very powerful capabilities for auto JIRA issue creation. So basically targeting what, uh, um, how you want those uh, tickets to be created. And again, all around centered around the dialing down the noise. Uh, Omri, did you have any comments you want to tell yeah, just want to say that because everything is an open source, we saw some customer combining all these plugins with our CLI tool and creating like, you know, a more advanced tool that will allow them to implement the solution based on their requirements and the workflows that they're trying like, to achieve. 
Yeah, and I, I guess that's the advantage of being open source with our projects, right? All about transparency and letting customers do very powerful things with the tools that we give them. And uh, last but not least, I wanted to highlight the Sneak repository. We have many plugins in that repository, but I did want to highlight the Sneak to HTML repository because a lot of customers have varying uh, reporting requirements. So, you know, if you wanted central visibility across all your different uh, build silos, certainly we do that with the Sneak monitor command. But with Sneak to HTML, it's the idea that a lot of customers have requirements about build artifacts that maybe they need for certain compliance reasons, or maybe they're handing out to various customers. Uh, and you know, a lot of times you have very specific data requirements. Maybe you need your logo on it. Maybe you need to have certain data, like the CVSS score. Maybe there's certain things you don't want to show in that report. Um, so the Sneak to HTML report was something that we created that uh, essentially generates that HTML report, but a lot of customers will use that as the basis of creating their own plugins, and it shows you how to read through the, uh, the JSON output of our API, or specifically, sorry, the CLI JSON output, um, and it's a very powerful capability. So uh, we just wanted to make sure you were aware of those plugins, um, and I guess having said that, I, I want to thank everybody for coming to today's presentation. Uh, both Omri and I will be on the chat to answer your questions, so thank you and I hope you're enjoying SneakCon. Thanks, everybody.